Yes, uh, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me now. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of exploring the e art of Idria Lace, a journey into Slovenia's rich tradition of bobbin lace with Alexandria or Ali Zupan Marguccio. And um, thank you again. Uh, and sorry for our delay in the start. We had some technical difficulties, which we have now overcome, hopefully. I'm Nicole Kusold Matteo, and on behalf of the more than approximately 20 volunteer organizers, I welcome you to the 12th annual Cleveland Krentovania. Dobro dojli. Thank you to the unwavering support and enthusiasm from, from participants like you. Over the last 12 years, the festival has grown to a multi-day arts, culture, and music festival, which is Cleveland's largest Mardi Gras celebration, attracting people from all walks of life throughout the Northeast Ohio area, the United States, and now countries beyond with virtual programming like this tonight. 
Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsors. Our 2024 presenting sponsors are American Mutual Life Association and Shaliga Drug. Please support all of our sponsors as they have supported us. Cleveland Transylvania is also supported in part by residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture Association. We are grateful to all of our partners and numerous volunteers. This festival is entirely organized by volunteers, and it really does take a village to put on an eight-day festival. And we thank the many, many people who have helped bring this year's festival and programming to life. Now, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's presenter. Ali Zupan Marguccio is the great-granddaughter of a Slovene Bob and Lace maker. And Ali is one of the, if not the, premier subject matter expert on Idria Lace in North America. Ali has studied traditional bob and lace making techniques in Slovenia and is prolifically involved in the North American lace community, teaching, speaking, and authoring numerous written works related to lace making. Ali, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we're so excited to have you. And Ali has put together a wonderful presentation for tonight and for the sake for technical ease of which we uh, had a small hiccup earlier. So this is probably a good idea. We pre-recorded her presentation, but I invite all of you um, as you're watching the presentation to in our comments on YouTube and Facebook, let us know any questions that you have for Allie. And we will go through that in a live Q and A after her presentation has ended. Um, Allie is willing to entertain all kinds of questions and other comments or inquiries that you might have to lace making. And um, so we are, are welcoming that very much. I also want to invite you um, to post pictures of any Idria lace that you may have in your family or in your home. We know that lots of people in the Slovenian American community have these beautiful handicraft works. And we invite you to share pictures of those works in the comments on Facebook, um, on YouTube, you cannot post a picture. So head on over to the Facebook stream to post your photos in the comments of this session. And we can all enjoy those beautiful handicraft works together. Um, let's see here. I think without any further ado, we can go ahead and get into the session. Welcome everyone. My name is Alexandria Zupan Margusio. My friends call me Allie. I want to thank you for allowing me to share my story with you today. I especially want to thank Nicole for inviting me to Cleveland Kiran Tavanye virtually. My experiences may be familiar in some ways of yours. I am a second generation Slovenian on my father's side and a third generation German on my mother's side. Despite my mixed ethnicities, I grew up with a very strong connection to my Slovenian roots. The presentation I am about to give is my personal journey with Idria Lace, based on my family experiences. My great-grandparents and their young family that included my grandmother immigrated from an area in western Slovenia that is known as the Idria Lace region. Handmade bobbin lace was made in other parts of Slovenia, and there were as many as 12 different schools. The first lace school was opened in Ljubljana in 1763, followed by Idria in 1876. The only remaining lace school open today is in Idria with branch schools in surrounding villages. Over 700 students between the ages of 5 and 15 are educated each year in the Idria Lace program. In this presentation, I will be using the terms Idria Lace and Slovenian Lace. They are synonymous of all laces made in Slovenian today. Life is a journey with problems to solve and lessons to learn, but most of all, to enjoy. Chapter One, Childhood Memories. About 100 years ago, my paternal grandparents, Michael and Maria Respite, made the decision to leave their home, 
which was the kingdom of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, three Slavic ethnic groups that were at the time part of the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. Their destination was the United States of America for her sisters. She learned from her mother, also named Maria, who learned from her mother. It was a handicraft that was passed down through many generations in Slovenian families that lived in the western part of the kingdom. The making of handmade lace was more than just a hobby. It was a means of making money to supplement the salaries of the men in the family who were mostly miners of mercury or coal. My great-grandfather was a coal miner. I found these three pieces of Slovenian bobbin lace in my grandmother's cedar chest after she passed away. I believe that the broad tape pieces, which are the four corners that you see, were made by her mother, my great-grandmother, as they are indicative of the lace being made there during the time she was a young woman still living in Austria-Hungary. While my great-grandmother did not bring her lace pillow with her when she immigrated, she may have brought these pieces with her to make a tablecloth or a dresser cloth for her new home. The Madonna in the center was made and gifted to my father by his cousin, Juliana. The Madonna was worked in the Idria narrow tape technique. I will discuss the two types of laces later in the presentation. In the late 1900s, there was little work to be found in parts of Europe, and Michael was forced to travel to other regions in search of work to support his young family. Family records indicate that he traveled to Bohemia, now called Czech Republic, to find work. On April 26, 1915, the Treaty of London, which was a secret treaty between Italy and the Allied forces of France, Britain, and Russia, decreed that if Italy agreed to join forces with the Allied troops, they would be promised the port city of Trieste, a major seaport on the Adriatic Sea, as well as other territories to the east of Trieste. On the 3rd of November, 1918, the Italian army seized the western part of the Slovenian territory in compliance with the stipulations of the Treaty of London, pushing their border further east. Ethnic Slovenians living in the Idria Lace region were now under Italian occupation. It was shortly after the Italian occupation that my great-grandparents and their growing family made the difficult decision to immigrate to the United States. And the young lady with the bow in her hair is my grandmother. I was fortunate in that my grandparents and my dad kept in touch with their family still living in Europe. I remember as a child, my dad receiving letters from his cousins. This was the time when ethnic Slovenians were now living in Yugoslavia. My dad would translate the letters he received and then read them to us in English. As a result, I got to know my cousins quite well through letters and pictures that were sent. But the cousins from Slovenia also sent something else I admired. There were handmade pieces of beautiful lace that were made. Here are only three of the many pieces of handmade bobbin lace or chipka that my dad received in those letters. It wasn't until 1979 that I was able to finally meet one of his cousins in person. Her name was Juliana, and she was a lace maker. And she became my inspiration to become a lace maker myself someday. This was in August of 1979. When I look back, I can't help but think of how brave she was to come to the United States by herself. She could not speak a word of English but somehow we managed to communicate quite well. She brought gifts for everyone, but the one thing I will never forget is that a bottle of a liquor 
called Slivovitz had broken in her luggage, and what a smell that was. A very special thing she brought with her was her bobbin lace pillow. I couldn't wait to see how this beautiful lace was made. With my dad as translator, Julie, as we called her, asked my mom if she had any butcher paper and a pen. She drew a lace pattern on the paper and told us that this design was for lace that could be sewn on the corners of a dresser cloth. Then she pinned the pattern to her pillow, hung the bobbins onto the pattern using the pins, and proceeded to weave her design. She made lace almost every day of her visit, and I would sit and watch her for hours. When my dad came home from work, the two of them would visit with various relatives, and she would gift her handmade lace motifs to them. The day she left, she gave the pillow to my mom and told her that she must learn to make lace. My mom never followed through, but many years later, I decided that I was going to learn to make Slovenian lace. Chapter 2 Lace Making as an in Industry What is bobbin lace, you might be asking? Bobbin lace is believed to have originated in Italy sometime in the 1500s. Its production spread to other parts of Europe throughout the next several centuries. It is lace that is woven by hand into various designs on a firm pillow using many fine threads that are attached or wound around wooden bobbins. Originally, fine linen thread was used, and eventually silk and cotton threads became popular choices. High-quality lace required many hours to produce and was extremely expensive. Originally, lace purchases were restricted to royalty and aristocracy. And here you can uh, see that this gentleman is wearing a beautiful lace collar. And it, this was bobbin lace. Eventually, lace machines were invented. In 1768, John Heathcote invented the bobbin net machine, which was patented in 1809. The industrialization of lace was in full effect by 1840. A machine soon replaced the lace makers with less skilled workers who operated the machines. Lace machines could produce thousands of yards of lace in a short period of time. And I'd like to note here that handmade lace, on the average, um, you could make one square inch per hour. Handmade bobbin lace was no longer in demand, especially in Western Europe. In the early 1800s, the two major industries in the municipality of Idria, Slovenia, and the surrounding towns and villages were mercury mining and lace making. It was also used to decorate ethnic costumes. Ironically, while handmade lace in the Western European countries was being replaced by machine-made lace, the Idria lace region of Slovenia under Austro-Hungarian rule experienced growth from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. The first specialized lace shop opened in Idria in 1860. To supplement the wages of the miners, women and men alike made lace that was bought and resold by private salesmen, local shops, and Italian vendors. In some cases, lace was sold through catalogs. Because of the Industrial Revolution and the invention of machines that made bobbin lace, handmade lace fell out of favor with the royalty and aristocracy. They wanted the latest and the greatest machine-made lace. It was several hundred years in coming, but finally the bourgeoisie or middle class was able to purchase handmade lace to wear. Here you see pictures of bobbin lace on ladies' dresses that would have been worn in the 1890s and early 1900s. 
The dresses were on exhibit at the Idria Lace uh, Castle Museum in 2016. Despite a growing market for handmade lace, the government did not oversee merchants or protect lace makers from being exploited. By the year 1905, a lace maker's earnings were the highest they had ever been. As a result, the first Idria Lace Cooperative was established as a means of monitoring lace maker salaries. This was definitely an idea ahead of its time. It was during this time period that the Idria Lace School was established by Ivanka Fernandic in 1876. It is the largest and oldest lace school in the world and has been operating continuously since its establishment. What were the earnings of miners and lace makers, you may be wondering? The crone or crown was the official currency of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In 1915, 6.5 krone was the equivalent of one US dollar. If you were a lace maker in the Carniola region, as was my great grandmother, or a miner, as was my great grandfather, here is what you could expect to earn. Keep in mind that a pair of shoes for a miner could cost 12 kroners. So in the year 1900, 6.5 krones or crowns equaled one US dollar. So a beginning miner could earn 25 crowns a month. An experienced miner could earn 35 to 38 crowns a month. A diligent lace maker could earn 0.6 crowns a day or up to 18 crowns a month, contingent on working 30 days per month. Not very much time off, was there, for lace makers? Wages in 1910, a miner could earn 50 crowns for 14 hours of work per day. So the salary went up and it went up for lace makers. However, they earned one crown for 14 works, 14 hours of work per day. World War I had a significant impact on the lace market in the Idria Lace region. After 1914, the conditions in the lace market changed and the Idria lace makers could only compete by producing a greater quantity of lace if they wanted to sell it. There was also a shortage of thread and the thread they could get was lower in quality. As a result, the lace was sold at any price the lace maker could get. Linen thread was no longer affordable and it was cheaper to make the lace with cotton thread. After the Italian occupation, the Slovenian lace market, market was taken over by the Italians. They started marketing it to Austria, Sweden, Finland, and Argentina. And the Nat National Central Institute of Women's Home Crafts in Ljubljana was created to organize lace makers. To better market the lace being made by the Slovenian lace makers, the Italian lace merchants changed the look of the typical lace being made to one that looked very similar to the Italian laces that were popular. The original broad tape that was worked with expensive linen thread, that's the one you see on the left, required six to eight pair of bobbins to work a design. It was changed to what is known today as Idria Narrow Tape Lace, which you see on the right. It is worked with cotton thread and uses on the average five pair of bobbins. Less bobbins equals less thread and a faster turnaround. 
In this picture, you can see three laces. Two are Italian laces and one Slovenian. To the average buyer of lace, they may think that they are all the same because they look similar. I've had students show me a piece of lace that they bought in an antique store that they thought was Idria lace when in fact were. This flower is called the Cantu flower and is from traditional Cantu lace that originated in Milan, Italy. That's the middle piece that you see there is the actual Cantu lace. The design elements in the piece of Slovenian lace, the, meaning the little flower, show the Italian influence on Slovene lace while the, while the Idria lace region was under occupation. These Italian lace elements are still found in Idria lace today. Many of your Slovene relatives may have called their country of origin Yugoslavia. My grandparents refused. Yugoslavia was the name given to three successive countries, Slovenia, Croatia, and Serbia, and was formed in 1929. Socialist Yugoslavia in 1946 was formed after the partisan resistance helped the Axis power to liberate it from the Germans. Eventually, Yugoslavia adopted a communist government under the governance of Josip Broj Tito. Bobbin lace became stagnant during World War II. I found an interesting diary online written by a man named Anton Zakaj. He and his family did not support the communist government of Yugoslavia and eventually became refugees. They lived in Austria for about six years, I believe, before immigrating to the United States. If you read the caption, it was the sale of bobbin lace that helped to make their lives more bearable. Anton was the generation of my grandparents, and once they immigrated, they happily left the trials of living under communism behind. Regarding the making of bobbin lace during uh, Tito's rule in Yugoslavia, the ethnic cultural traditions were not forbidden, but they were not encouraged. So bobbin lace was one of those cultural traditions. Uh, in Russia, though, it was forbidden, but thankfully it wasn't in Yugoslavia times. Bobbin, but bobbin lace was not a profitable commodity. Lace making was considered part of the old way, but it continued to be passed down in families without formal instruction. Slovene lace makers always remain proud of their ethnic heritage. And as an aside, uh, I my father traveled to the former Yugoslavia many times to visit with his relatives that remained there. It was quite difficult for them to get things that we take for granted, like coffee or chocolate and clothing of good quality. He would take an entire suitcase of clothes, specifically blue jeans and cotton shirts and underwear, and give them to his family. Chapter three, time to learn. Trying to find a teacher of Slovenian lace turned out to be difficult. I attended many picnics and events at Enon Valley in Pennsylvania and met ladies who were making lace, but their answer was always the same when I inquired about finding a teacher. They would tell me some version of this. This is the old way that lace was made. It's no longer popular. You can buy lace in the store. I only know what my mother taught me. I'm not a teacher. I came to find out later that even in Slovenia, most women of my grandparents and parents' generations felt the same way, most likely due to communism. Lace was considered a luxury. Not having much luck with finding a Slovenian lace teacher, I decided to study with several ladies I met at a living history event called Mountain Craft Days in Somerset, Pennsylvania. At the time, they all made fine laces from Western Europe, like laces from Belgium and France and England. But I knew that the stitches were the same as in Slovenian bobbin lace. And if I learned this type, their types of laces, it would be a start. 
As I progressed and became better, a better lace maker, I started teaching others. I knew that students in Idria can choose to start learning bobbin lace in kindergarten. So I started a lace club in the public school where I worked as an elementary librarian for 28 years. The kids loved it. Here you can see the students using the flat pillows that are used for ma making many European, Western European laces. I started learning lace making on a cookie pillow because that was what her was. She passed away two years ago. Um, she lived two hours for me. Here I am teaching lace classes at the Bottle Works Ethnic Art Center in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. In the picture on the right, I am wearing a Slovenian scarf that is part of the traditional costume. It was about this same time that my Slovenian cousin, Marko Raspet, who I had been corresponding with via email and knew how badly I wanted to learn chipka, or lace, sent me a package. In it were my first traditional punkol, or bolster pillow, and an Idria bobbin lace textbook used for adult instruction. There were a few sentences of English translation in this book, but the pictures and diagrams for each student were ex for each pattern, excuse me, were excellent. So my lace teacher, Susie Johnson, started helping me work my way through this book using the diagrams and excellent close-up photos. I couldn't practice using my new Slovenian lace pillow though because I was missing something very important, the bobbins. The bobbins I was using on my Belgian style pillow were much too small. This is, was the very first piece of Idria or Slovenian bobbin lace I made using my Belgium lace pillow and Belgian bobbins. Several months after I received the punkel for Marco, I received a package from Julie, who I hadn't seen for nearly 25 years. My dad had told her in a letter about Marco's gift to me. In this shadow box, you see the contents of Julie's package, a picture of her standing outside of her beautiful Alpine home built in the year 1500. She actually has government records and a plaque on the front declaring it an historic home, a lace heart that she made, and a pair of Idria bobbins. I cut the stamps off the package because they were stamps commemorating Slovenian bobbin lace. In the letter she included that my dad translated for me, there was this sentence. I hear that your husband is a woodworker. Tell him to make you 10 pair of these bobbins. My husband did, and I was one step closer to realizing my dream. Chapter Four, Apprenticeship. About two years after I began learning bobbin lace, I started teaching beginner classes at the Bottle Works Ethnic Arts Center as part of the University of Pittsburgh Adult Outreach Program. I was trying to spread the word about this beautiful handicraft that was slowly becoming a dying art. It was the Bottle Works Ethnic Art Center that I met two ladies, Marcine Glover, who was their um, <clears throat> community outreach, excuse me, who was their activities coordinator, and Rosemary Pawlowski, their executive director whose information and advice helped to change the trajectory of my bobbin lace journey. They told me that there was a state grant available for me to study bobbin lace, and I was the only person they knew that would qualify for it. The grant was from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and was for an individual who was interested in carrying on a family arts tradition and wanted to study with a master teacher. <clears throat> I applied for the grant in 2007 with the help of my cousin Marco, who was able to give me contacts since he grew up near Idria and went to school there. My acceptance 
as a lay student was contingent on my having a piece of my own idri lace made in the United States, juried by the director of the lace school, Metka Fortuna. I hadn't planned on making a trip to Slovenia that year, but when school finished that June for me, off I went. This is the piece of lace that I took to be juried. Metka was pleased with my work, and her only criticism was that I had used linen thread instead of cotton on a narrow tape pattern. I had to explain to her that there were no lace suppliers in the United States at the time that were carrying Idria lace thread. All the suppliers at that time in the United States were only carrying threads used in Western Europe. When she told me she considered me to be an intermediate lace maker, I was thrilled. My practice had paid off. I was awarded the full grant amount of $4,000, which was enough to pay for my plane fare and tuition. The master teacher assigned to me was Stana Fraley, whose lace classroom was in the elementary school located in Serkno, Slovenia, about 30, a 30-minute 30 drive north of Idria. I would be going there for my classes. Stana spoke fairly good English, which was something I had requested in my grant application. Since my great-grandparents came from a small village near Serkno, I knew from my dad's genealogy research that they had been married in Serkno at the Church of St. Anne. It was also the church that held the family records of my grandmother's side of the family. This is the, excuse me, this is the fresco on the front of St. Anne's that had been replaced only a few years prior to my visit. It had been damaged by bombing during World War II. In the fresco, or on the fresco, you see St. Anne and her husband, St. Joachim, and their daughter Mary, the Blessed Virgin and Mother of Jesus. At the feet of St. Anne, there is a lace pillow with bobbins. Bobbin lace was obviously a revered part of this town's history. I completed my apprenticeship in June of 2008. It was a specialized curriculum created specifically for me. I spent 20 hours of instruction time with my teacher, five hours each day for four days, plus homework. My husband and I were staying with my cousin Marco and his wife Stana, or, or Nada, who lived in Dumjali, a suburb of Ljubljana, about one hour from Serkno. I would sit outside on the balcony of their home each evening after dinner and complete my homework. There was a maker of button box accordions who lived down the street from Marco, who would sit outside and play his accordion every night. The ambiance was perfect. This is my finished apprenticeship lace on the pillow on the, that you see on the right and off the pillow with the pins removed on the left. I spent the morning of my last day of studies with Stana in Serkno discussing what I had learned, and she answered questions I had. After lunch, we drove back to Idria and met with Metka, the lace director, to have her evaluate my completed lace. I was awarded a certificate and the goal I had worked towards for eight years had finally come to fruition. But little did I know how my life was going to change as a result of my studies. Chapter 5, Sharing Knowledge I arrived home at the end of June 2008, excited to practice what I had learned. At the beginning of July, I received a phone call from a teacher coordinator of and a uh, person that sells lace supplies in the United States, but she was the coordinator of the Finger Lace Lace Guild in Ithaca, New York, Holly Van Skyver. Holly is a nationally known lace teacher of English laces and a designer in the United States and was a friend of my, my teacher, my United States teacher, Susie. She asked if I would be interested in teaching a class in Idria Lace at their Lace Days conference in October. 
She had heard about my studies in Slovenia, and she asked if I would also give the keynote address telling everyone about my experiment, experience. Since Idria Lace was relatively new to the lace making world in the United States, I said yes. This would be my first official teaching job and speaking event on a national level. In the years since my apprenticeship studies, I've never stopped teaching bobbin lace. I teach at various places throughout the United States. Every year since 2012, I've taught at the, the International Organization of Laces annual conference. One of my students jokingly calls me the U.S. Ambassador of Slovenian Bobbin Lace. I have private students that come to my home and from out of town. I teach workshops to regional groups all over the United States. Holly credits me with introducing the use of the bolster pillow to lace makers in the United States. I even taught workshop classes via Zoom during COVID. Demonstrating has proved to be a great way of increasing interest and spreading the word about Slovenian bobbin lace. And because I am teacher, I've, I've, got, I've gained many students through demonstrating. Here I am demonstrating at the Hein History Center in Pittsburgh and at the Wheaton Arts Museum in Millville, New Jersey at their annual Baltic Festival. My work and apprenticeship study photos were on display at the Bottle Works Ethnic Arts Center in the summer of 2009. I was named a bottle artist in 2011 when I was asked to create a bottle or vase to showcase my art form for the Bottle Works Art Center annual fund fundraiser. The building housing the Ethnic Art Center was once the site of a glass bottle making factory that produced bob bottles for knee high soda pop. My husband turned a wooden vase that I applied a piece of my handmade lace to. The vase was auctioned off at a dinner event, and the lady that purchased my lace vase was from Ohio. She displayed it in her home for many years, but when she was placed in memory care a few years ago, her family gave it back to me so I could continue to show it at lace events. In 2016, my lace work was part of an ethnic arts exhibit at the Pennsylvania Governor's Mansion in Harrisburg. In 2017, I was one of four fiber artists featured in a PBS documentary titled Pennsylvania Folklore Woven Together. This was a pivotal time in my life. I had just finished chemo and radiation treatment for breast cancer, and my hair had finally started to grow back. It was snow white and extremely short. I decided that if I that if I was going to agree to be interviewed and filmed, I would do it as my authentic self and show the world that cancer survivors can go on to do big things. By the way, I taught at the IOLI conference that year while going through chemotherapy. In 2019, I was asked to film a DVD tutorial by a film producer in California whose wife had taken up bobbin lace. When he retired from his job as a cinematographer and a production manager, he decided to make videos of various lace, lace teachers so that the people who do not have access to a lace teacher or have the money to attend workshops or conventions could still learn bobbin lace. In 2020, my video, An Introduction to Idria Narrow tape technique was launched in a DVD and thumb drive formats. I designed the three patterns included. This video is intended for students with prior knowledge of basic bobbin lace stitches. Chapter six, the future of Idria or Slovene and Slovenian lace. The year I had my apprenticeship, the Slovenian government had recognized lace making 
as a national treasure to be preserved. Ten years later, in 2018, Idrielace was placed on the United Nations Education, Science, and Cultural Heritage, or UNESCO's Intangible List of the Cultural Heritage of Humanity. <coughs> Idria Lace, a tradition that had been passed down in families like mine for generations, is now a formal extracurricular educational program beginning in kindergarten and continuing until grade 12. Its philosophy is designed to nurture and enrich the art in both children and adults. It also honors those who have kept the tradition of Bob and Lace Alive in Slovenia. It honors the oldest lace school in the world, working continuously since 1876. It honors those Bob and Lace makers who through the centuries have made lace for enjoyment and survival. And it honors those who continue to teach Slovenian lace and encourage future, future generations to learn. New approaches and innovation are moving Idriles into the world of contemporary fashion and art. Because of the use of natural fibers and the fact that it is made by hand, lace is being recognized as a, as a sustainable craft or art form that is produced with the consideration of many environments, social, economic, cultural, and historical. It's a new medium for fashion designers, artists, and other creative individuals. There has been a collaboration between the Idria Lace Makers and the University of Ljubljana Faculty of Natural Sciences and Engineering. And new innovations and developments are goal to promote lace and win worldwide recognition. After I retired, my goal was to study my family history, but my dad beat me to it when he, re when he retired. Now I feel like I'm making history through lace making. I've always loved and admired fiber arts, even as a child. My mom taught me to sew, quilt, and knit. I taught myself to crochet. I loved to cross stitch and embroider, but none of those crafts has led me on such a life-changing journey as bobbin lace. It's been a journey of self-discovery, travel, meeting people from all over the world with shared interests, and most importantly, learning about what my Slovenian family endured and sacrificed in trying to build a life in both Europe and the United States. On this slide and the next few slides, you can see some of my lace work. Many of the patterns I use are purchased from Irma Pravanya a Slovenian lace pattern designer and former design teacher at the Idria Lace School. I've also in included some other pieces of my lace in the next few slides. And I have to say here, uh, the Idria Lace jewelry is one of my most popular classes and I use a metallic thread to work it. Here are three pieces of lace made by uh, or made for my grandchildren and made by uh, me. The first little monkey, though, was a pattern that I designed myself. That was actually my very first pattern design. Uh, it's not specifically Slovenian lace, but uh, it was I was designed it when I was learning the other laces uh, from Western Europe. The other two patterns are patterns uh, designed by Irma Pravanya. And they were for my two grandsons, Tyson and Drake. In the last five to six years, I've began I've begun designing my own lace patterns uh, to use as teaching patterns. The first one is a, a sampler, a rainbow sampler of decor decorative stitches in Idria lace. And the other two are... Uh, this center is a modern, more contemporary look of Id Idria Lace. And the Paisley piece is a more traditional 
looking piece of Id Idria lace. During COVID, uh, when the world was shut down, the Slovenian lace makers in Idria came up with a fabulous idea. They called it hashtag stay home, make lace. And different people, including the design teacher at the lace school, made specific patterns. Uh, Irma Pravanya made patterns as well. And they shared them on Facebook. And these are two of the many patterns that were shared. And they were all so much fun to work and, and gave you something to do when you were stuck at home during COVID. It was a brilliant idea for lace makers, that is. On one of my visits to Slovenia, I saw this poster hanging in Id Idria. It was advertising their annual lace festival. If you ever get the opportunity to go to the Idria Lace Festival, usually held the third weekend in June, it is an outstanding and memorable event. It is one big party that includes a parade, a craft show, a lace competition, polka music, dancing, and a beer and sausage feast. All of this to honor a tradition that began hundreds of years ago, Bob and Lace. As it says on the poster, Idria Lace Rocks. The end. Thank you so much, Ellie. That's such a wonderful presentation, especially the way that you were able to weave in your own family's story and how lace impacted the trajectory of your entire uh, sort of family's livelihood and being um, in that narrative. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So we have uh, joining with us uh, with people from across the United States and beyond, folks from Pennsylvania, Idaho, Florida, Illinois, and of course, Ohio, as well as other places. And so we got thank you all for being with us tonight. And we're going to start taking questions. Um, as the presentation has been going on, we've gotten questions through YouTube and Facebook. And it, of course, if you have more as we're doing this, feel free to put them in uh, the comments there. So one of our first questions, we have a number of questions on resources and people interested on getting started and learning how to uh, create this beautiful handicraft. Um, this is a, a question here. It seems like it was hard for you to find books on bobbin lace. Do you know of any books that are readily available here in the U.S. or what resources might you recommend to somebody? Um, there are there are very good books available now. Uh, the Idria Lay School has put out uh, a group of technique books uh, for students that wishing to learn on their own. And uh, they are available from my husband, who is a, we actually started a little business because I could not get in uh, information and thread and that and the materials that we, my students needed. So we took it upon ourselves to do our own thing. So my husband makes pillows. Uh, he makes the bobbins by hand. Um, we have thread, the thread that's cotton thread that's used. We sell books, technique books. They are also available from other vendors as well, not the pillows and the bobbins, but thread and books uh, in the United States. If people would, con can they can, you know, feel free to contact me. I can give you that information. Um, there's, you can also buy directly from the Idria Lace School. Uh, and, uh, but it's, to find it on Facebook or online, it's Chipkarska, Schwola, Idria. Uh, so it's it's the Slovenian way of, uh, you'd have to write it in, in Slovenian to find it on Facebook is what I'm trying to say. Um, I don't know if there's a way that we can get that information to people or not. Yeah, um, we can, um, first of all, why don't you tell us your website? What is Okay, my, website? our website is design, designsbymarguccio.com. Okay, and 
there people are able to buy the wooden boxes and the pillows that are needed to do this as well as the bobbins. And those are made right. here in America by your husband. Right. And we've also started importing baskets uh, because in, in uh, Slovenia, they use a basket, but we've tried for years to find somebody that could produce these baskets. They, we just can't seem to find anybody that gets the shape correctly. So we've started importing baskets if they want a true uh, setup. Uh, my husband also makes stand operations, so it does take, uh, you might have to wait a few months to get something, but you know, eventually we can get it to you. But um, that's why I said, you know, uh, we've, we out of, it's been, we've created this out of, you know, many requests by my students. Wonderful. Um, let's see here. We have another question from Jillian on YouTube. Jillian's asking um, if there are any online resources that you recommend for getting started on learning. Is there is there a place that you would recommend that people can visit online to, to learn? Or how would be the best way that you would say for somebody who's interested in getting started, um, learning to do this because I know, I mean, we're here because you are one of a kind here in <laughs> North America and there's really not a, a ton of people who are doing this type of work um, on the level that you are in teaching. Well, it, depending on where you live, there are actually lace groups all over the United States, you know, groups of women and men too, that uh, have formed to you know, spread the news of bobbin lace as in general, not specifically Slovenian lace, but bobbin lace in general. So my advice to people that w want to learn lace, uh, other than maybe coming to me <laughs> personally, would be to join a group and, and learn the stitches first. Because, you know, e even if you buy the books from Slovenia or, you know, or the books that we sell from Slovenia, or my videotape, you have to understand the basic bobbin lace stitches first. Um, I have, I've had people come to my home specifically just to learn the bolster pillow technique because there are not that many lace teachers in the United States that teach using a bolster pillow. The only other lady that I'm aware of um, is she teaches Slovak lace and they, you know, many, many of the Eastern European countries use bolster pillows. So, um, there aren't that many of us that teach it on using a bolster in the United States that is. So again, you know, if people would feel free to contact me, I'd be happy to, you know, lead them in some kind of a direction. I do teach, I do have like teaching jobs coming up. But usually these are for groups where people already understand the basics of bobbin lace. So if you've never learned uh, the basics before, that kind of eliminates you from that kind of a class. So, um, and I've also taught uh, via Zoom, you know, and I, you know, I'm willing to do that. You, my Zoom classes um, I, are not a formal thing. Usually what I do is I say, okay, well, you know, I'll be happy to help you out, um, but we will just work around each other's schedules. So that's how I do that. Nice. Because I, I am traveling. I do travel quite a bit. <laughs> um, and uh, again, the best way for, you're saying uh, for people to reach out to you is the best way to do that through your website, designs by yeah, yes, you can, yes, you can do that. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Usually, my husband is, my husband checks the website, and usually what he does is forward messages as like that, you know, call, asking for information to me. So, and then when I answer them, I'll, you know, I'll use my web, my personal email address to answer, and then we can, you know, go from there. Wonderful. And we'll drop a link to that in the comments here so that people can um, okay. go ahead and, and have access to that website. So we have some other questions about um, 
actually making the lace. So okay. the first question is, how long approximately does it take you to finish each piece? And I'm sure that's a variable question, but if you could talk a little bit about what what all goes into this. Okay, so in the video or in the presentation, I mentioned that, you know, an average was one square inch an hour. However, um, Eastern European laces and specifically Slovenian laces only require uh, five to seven pair usually at, on an average. So because, because you're working with less threads, you know, it, it can go at a quicker pace. So, for example, um, I'm trying to think uh, based on some of the pictures that I showed, but, you know, I mean, I've spent probably over 100 hours on some pieces wow. because, you know, it's, it's all done by hand. Um, so, for example, I was demonstrating, I can tell you this, I was demonstrating one time at an event and a lady said to me, oh, I would love for you to make a wedding garter, a handmade wedding garter for my daughter's wedding. And I said, well, typically I don't, I've never sold my lace. Uh, so I really didn't know even what to, ch I would charge for something like that uh, because I'm strictly all about educating other people. But uh, when I asked her when her daughter's wedding was, it was like two months <laughs> you know, it was in two months time. I would have never had enough time to finish that a piece of lace in two months. So, well, you know, small there, you know, it runs the gamut. There are small pieces that I can finish in a day. And I've worked on things, pieces that took me over a hundred hours. So you have to be willing to put in some time. You had made mention uh, multiple times of different kinds of threads you were using. Uh, in one instance, you were talking about using cotton threads, and then you were talking about using metallic threads. What is the difference? Why is it important? And uh, kind of, can you talk about the significance of what the material is of the thread? Well, in with Slovenian laces, um, I I have always tried to stay true to the tradition. So if it is a broad tape piece of lace, traditionally that was made with linen. If it is a narrow a piece of lace and narrow, the narrow tape, then it was all traditionally made with cotton thread. Uh, although I have made some of my broad tape pieces with cotton thread, as long as the, uh, it, as long as the thread sizes match up. Um, the thread that I use is specifically made for lace and it and all lace most bobbin laces are made with uh, threads that are specifically uh, made for the lace industry and they all come from Europe so um, you know usually you don't go to the local Joanne fabric store and buy your thread there because it, you know you each pattern calls for a specific size of thread. Okay, and interesting. as far as the metallics go, um, that obviously is a more contemporary thread to use, but um, I wouldn't wear it for something that would be close to your skin because it, it would be scratchy, but it's, it's a little bit stiffer, so that's why I use it a lot for jewelry because it holds holds up well it also uh, acts as a nice accent thread to put through a piece uh, what one thing that i wanted to point out here regarding pieces that i make i encourage my students to make pieces that they are going to actually use so because i have pieces uh, of lace that are you know like dresser claws um uh, edgings for different pieces that were sent to me by relatives or sent to my dad and I use them and I wash them and they that's the one thing I have to say about Idria lace it is very utilitarian and it is meant to be used and those of those of you that have gone to Slovenia have probably seen lace everywhere it's they have it on their curtains on window blinds on tablecloths 
they wear it on their clothing, they wear it as jewelry. So it is always something that they're very proud of, but they use it as opposed to squirreling it away in a dresser somewhere, <laughs> which um, that was one of the things that I used to criticize my colleagues that did not make <laughs> Slovenian lace when I was first learning. I said, like, why aren't you using this? You know, this the stuff that my relatives send, we use it and it can be washed and it doesn't shrink. And, you know, but it's there's a difference because the Western European laces traditionally are made with much, much finer thread than the Slovenian laces. That is a great point. And we have another question here actually asking exact to elaborate more on that about the distinction between Slovenian lace and then other European laces. I know you and I have talked about, um, you know, sometimes Slovenian lace is mistaken uh, for Italian lace and vice versa. How right. do we tell them apart? What makes each type special? And um, what are we looking for here when we're well, looking for different regional laces? You have to think of it as a tradition. And it was something, uh, it was a, the designs actually have to do with ethnic pride. So there, you know, there might be one small village in a country that has a specific design. And when somebody sees that design, then they know that that comes from, let's say, Poland or meander, uh, we, which we call a tape. That is indicative of Slovenian lace. However, the designs are evolving uh, and with contemporary laces. And what you see nowadays is kind of a stretch from what you would have seen, let's say, when my, my uh, grandmother was making lace. So, um, you know, they're working with the fashion industry. So, you know, each play, you know, like I can think of in England, each town had their own lace. There was Honiton and Bedfordshire and, and uh, Buckinghamshire. They each had their own specific style. So it's a source of ethnic pride. Thank you. And one of the, one of the other questions that we have here is how, um, what are some of the ways or the modern ways that Idria lace making is living on, especially in Slovenia through the Idria lace making school. Like, you know, you just mentioned some, it, there is some divergence and modernization of the style. Can you talk a little bit more about that and some of the artistic um, creativity that is happening there, but as well as the, you know, staying true or, or uh, diverging from what is more traditional? Well, for one thing, the Idria Lace School has is has collaborated with other lace schools in Europe. Um, so they, in, in through collaboration, they are uh, helping to mesh, you know, their designs and you know getting ideas from other lace makers. You have to understand that uh, when they were part of Yugoslavia, they, you know, they weren't working with other lace schools. They didn't know what other lay schools were doing as far as design. And now that they're a, a, an independent country, they've been able to collaborate and that's made a, a world of difference. Um, something I'll share with you, the last time I was in uh, Slovenia uh, and I was at the lay school, I happened to know, I, I was taking a design class from Maya Zvetnik and um, I noticed when I when we would take a break in the stairwells of the hall of the uh, school, they would have museum cases with student work in them, in them. And I was looking closely, and I was no noticing design elements in the student work that were not typically in traditional Slovenian laces. So I brought that up and that, you know, in that regard, I'm kind of glad that I studied other laces before I was able to study in Slovenia because it gave me a little bit more of a background. But what I discovered was Maya, as she said, she encourages her students to study lace, other laces, you know, go online, look at other pieces of lace, study their design elements, see if you can figure out how they're created and then she gives them permission then to create that work or incorporate that work into their own pieces that they, they are designing. 
But what she said afterwards, I thought was kind of interesting because she told she said to me, well, if they ask my permission to do this, then it is Idria Lace. <laughs> Even though if they have an element from a Belgium lace or an element that you typically would see in an English lace or a French lace, if she gives their permission to incorporate it, it's still Idria lace, which I thought was an interesting concept. But, um, you know, it's it's all about collaboration now. You know, it, it when it was an industry, it was a very it was secretive. And nobody was allowed to share what they did. You know, the lace maker was forbidden to share anything with anybody else because it was an industry and it was supposed to be specifically for that region. Uh, one, fun, uh, one other thing that I, comes to mind, too, is American lace makers, I think it's because, you know, our ancestors have come from all over the world, when you think about it. Uh, one of the thing, first things my lace teacher asked me was, why don't American lace makers just learn one thing and get really good at it? But, you know, that's the way it is. You know, our culture is a little bit different here in the United States. So, you know, we see something we want to try. It doesn't matter where it came from. So, um, so but my, you know, my intention of learning was a little bit different in that I, I really wanted to carry on this family tradition. And I was... Uh, my great great grandmother died young, and you know there was she never really had a chance to pass anything on to her daughters. So, I also wanted to ask you about that legacy and that you know feeling of wanting to pass things out. I know you and I before this session have talked about you have spent an extraordinary amount of time teaching people this specific technique and you're looking for essentially a way to carry on this tradition in North America. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I guess in my heart, I had always thought that my granddaughter might be interested. <laughs> uh, at the age of 14, she's not interested right now um, because she's busy with sports. She's She loves softball and basketball. So, uh, but uh, as I get older, I'm wondering, uh, I don't want somebody else to run into what I ran into. And that was meeting all these ladies that were making beautiful lace, but not willing to share what they knew. So um, my dream now that I'm almost the age of 70 <laughs> is to hopefully find somebody that I can serve as a mentor to that might have the same passion and want to learn this and pass it on to other people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just brought me a lot of joy. I can't tell you how many people that I've met from all over the world, um, meeting, uh, going, being able to see where my grandparents grew up. Uh, my grandfather's home is still intact. Um, you know, and I, it, it, it was such an emotional thing for me on top of learning part of their, the cult, Slovene culture, you know, uh, in order in, to touch base with cousins that I only heard about in letters and just see where my family came from. You know, it's just... I, I it's I can't even put it into words other than it it was just as important as learning the lace to, to you know to see where my my uh, family came from. So just to be clear, this is an outright shout out to anybody who wants <laughs> yes. to become the protege of North America's leading Adria lace <laughs> <laughs> subject matter expert, right? Uh, let's not be shy here, right? Well, so, and, and, and you know, I, I'm i really hoping that there's, some, I, you know, I've talked to many young, young ladies that were in design school and, you know, because, because of the fact that you're using natural materials and you're doing everything by hand, um, you know, it really falls in place with the way of thinking nowadays, you know, and, um, 
you know, when I had, when my mother was very sick and shortly before she passed away and I was supposed to teach, I, uh, I didn't think I might go to one of these big conferences that I teach at every year, the International Order, uh, Organization of LACE. And so they asked me, could I find a substitute teacher? And I said, sure, I have some students. That, and then I was able to go to this conference. But, you know, that's that's why I think, I, you know, everybody in the lace world in the United States is trying to encourage young people uh, who are interested in this type of thing to reach out and, and try it, you know, and see if see if you like it. And since this focuses on the Slovene community. I'm hoping that maybe there's somebody there that would be interested. And I would I'm be happy to too. be a mentor. I'm hoping too. So it and just I think very casually here in the Cleveland area Slovenian American community, I have only known one woman who did this that I was able to see myself. And I was a child when she passed. So it has, I think, been a long time since somebody in the community, at least that I'm aware of, has been able to to share this information, at least on a more public um, basis. That, you know, and so I hope that this conversation will maybe spark some connections where we can see more of this handicraft being done in a modern context while still honoring our, our shared cultural heritage. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> um, Ellie, is there anything that you wanted to say before we close out here? Um, well, I, I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity um, to reach uh, an, a, a slightly different audience than I normally would be speaking to. Um, and I hope that it encourages people to think about, you know, there are many, I, Bob and Lace is just one of many different um, handicrafts, traditional handicrafts that are Slovenian. And, and uh, I can't encourage you enough if you haven't visited Slovenia to go there. It is one of the most beautiful Alpine countries in Europe. It's, the people are friendly. Um, it's, it, you'll enjoy it, I'm sure. So. Well, thank you so much. This has been, I would say both informative and honestly heartwarming. I mean, I just love the personal narrative here from from yourself and for being so open and candid with us about sharing the impact of lace in your own life and your family. So thank you so much for that, you know, generosity of knowledge sharing and uh, storytelling. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for inviting me. My pleasure. See the rest of the festival for this year. We've had a number of events already occur and we have a number lined up still to go um are we sharing the slide okay wonderful so you will see we have i'll call out a couple tomorrow we will have a simplified version of cream this is a 30 minute uh 30 minute demo and or maybe the demo is gonna be shorter but it'll take you about 30 minutes it's so delicious and it's just a very quick and easy way to make something that we all know and love. Um, the other things I'd like to give a shout out to are our museum and archives event, our event or rather at the museum and archives. It's an exhibit of uh, sports memorabilia. We also are having a Prasharan Day celebration on February the 8th, which is actually Prasharan Day. Slovenia is one of the only countries in the world that celebrates culture as a national holiday. And this is it. It's February. So this will be online and in person. In person, if you're coming, um, we ask that you do register uh, for a free ticket, complimentary ticket uh, online, just so that we can get a better sense of who is all coming. The night will include uh, jazz, poetry, and a very exclusive a tour of the Deemer Mansion, which is located on the Slovenian National Home Grounds. And in the mansion, there is an extensive collection of fine art by Gregor Perushik that will be on display. And this is a very rare opportunity for the public to see this building and the art in it. Um, it will also have a, a complimentary cocktail hour after. So very 
lovely evening plan. Please do come and join us for that. Then on Saturday, February 10th, we will have our 5K race. Registration is available. Please go ahead and register for the 5K um, on our website through Hermes, who's orchestrating the race. We will have our um, Children's Village. And uh, let's see here. And I think that's probably all of my notes for today. But I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for the cooking demo. And thank you again for joining us. We hope that you uh, enjoy this program. And if you did, please feel free to like us on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, it helps us to get the word out. So thank you so much and have a great evening.